Ah, we finally get to the Saber of Black. You know, this was one of those servants that had been voted for a fair amount of times in every single poll. Like, coming in second, I think, around 8 times in a row, but just never quite getting enough to win the vote. Until now, that is. So, all of you Saber fans can finally be happy, because it's time for the Dragon Budded Knight's moment in the spotlight. Or you may know him as Siegfried, or in Fate Apocrypha, the Saber of Black. Although his time was really short in the show, spanning a grand total of 4 episodes before literally ripping his heart out so that Sieg could become the most OP thing since Kirito, he still manages to influence the outcome of the series 25 episodes down the line. But, to be honest, other than the fact that he slayed a dragon and drank its blood to become invulnerable, we don't really know too much about him. So let's take a more thorough look at who he was back when he was alive. Last episode we covered Atalanta's roots in Greek mythology, but now we're going to switch it over to some of that Norse stuff. You know, with the gods like Odin and Thor. Siegfried's legend originates from what's known as an epic poem called the Nibelungenlied, or in English, the Song of the Nibelungs. Not to be confused with a very similar story of the hero Sigurd. But rather than tell the story of his many adventures, this epic poem skips over the ones in which he received his sword and slew the dragon, to instead tell the tragedy of his death. Because apparently, hearing about a knight slay a dragon is much less interesting than the story of his way too conveniently planned out demise. And you'll see why I say this real soon, don't worry. To begin, we're gonna skip over Siegfried's birth, because he actually had a pretty luxurious upbringing. Mostly due to the fact that he was born a prince in the Netherlands, and unlike Semiramis, or Jack, or Karna, or Atlanta, he wasn't abandoned by some good-for-nothing parents. Which is pretty strange, because I thought we had a pretty good theme going on here. So let's start with the adventure where he got his sword Balmon. There are many variations to this story, but what is known is that Siegfried was asked to divide up some treasure equally to the heirs of a royal family known as the Nibelungen. In exchange, he'd be rewarded with the legendary sword. But what Siegfried thought was equal, the heirs didn't, so a fight broke out, and Siegfried just ended up killing them both. The people, who had just had their next kings killed, weren't quite happy, so they challenged Siegfried as well. But after losing about 12 giants and 700 or so warriors, the people just surrendered. They gave Siegfried all their treasure, including Balmung, and made him their king. Now before I go on, just know that there are many other interpretations of Siegfried's story, so I might be using them interchangeably without even knowing it. But moving on, Siegfried now in possession of this legendary sword, proceeded to go on another adventure to acquire even more treasure. This time, this treasure was guarded by a dwarf turned dragon named Fafnir. The details of this fight were glossed over, but essentially, Fafnir got his ass kicked and then Siegfried, like a true badass, bathed in the blood of his enemies, even got a bit weird and drank some of it, which, as you already know, ended up making him invulnerable. But because there was a small leaf on his back when he went for this little swim, there was a part of his body that didn't get touched by the dragon's blood, making that his one and only weak spot. It's at this point that Siegfried decides to travel to Burgundy because he had been hearing stories of a beautiful Burgundian princess named Primhild whom he wanted to marry. But the Burgundians would not allow him to meet her yet. More so, it was the king, Gunther, Krimhild's brother, who didn't allow the two to meet. Siegfried decided to stay in Burgundy anyway, most likely an attempt to gain the trust of the king so that he would allow him to meet his sister. Really, all it took was Siegfried to defeat an invading German tribe in order for Gunther to allow the two to meet. Not a big deal for someone who can't die. And so, they ended up meeting. But Siegfried was still unable to marry her. That was, up until King Gunther made a deal. Siegfried was to sail to Iceland with Gunther to help him in his attempts to marry the Icelandic queen, Brunhild. Once arrived at Iceland, the marriage is proposed, but the queen says that in order for the marriage to be accepted, Gunther has to beat Brunhild in three trials of strength, javelin, tossing a boulder, and a leap. Now, Gunther wasn't the strongest person, and after seeing the Icelandic queen go first, he knew that he was going to lose. And of course, in good old mythological fashion, Losing meant dying. So Siegfried does what he does best, and he goes to help out his buddy. He retrieves an invisible cloak that he just so happened to get from one of his adventures, puts it on, and guides Gunther with ease through each of the trials. Gunther wins, and the two get married. Krimhild and Siegfried are then married shortly after. And that's it, happy ending for everybody. <laughs> nah, but seriously, Brunhild had a feeling that something was off. So when Gunther had tried to sleep with her, she instead tied him up and hung him from the ceiling. So it was clear that Gunther wasn't going to get any action until he could overpower Brunhild. So what does he do? He goes and asks Siegfried for help. Now you're probably thinking that since Siegfried's a heroic spirit and all, 
By saying he'd help, surely he just means that he'll have a nice little chat or something, right? Nope, this man gets his invisibility cloak, sneaks into Gunther's room at night, then beats Brunhild into submission so that Gunther can have his way with her. Well then, that was quite unexpected. But anyway, before Siegfried leaves, he takes Brunhild's ring and belt and gives it to Krimhild before leaving to go back to the Netherlands. Now, before we go on, don't even bother asking me how this Icelandic queen didn't even realize that she was getting the shit beat out of her by some invisible force, alright? So that's just beyond me. Anyway, a few years pass and Siegfried is visiting Gunther in Iceland. But this whole time, Brunhild has believed that Siegfried is of lower status than Gunther because, for some reason, even though the whole kingdom knows of his adventures, Brunhild hasn't heard a thing. This chick has to be the most oblivious person that we've ever come across. So she spouts on and on about how Gunther is better than Siegfried to Krimhild. The two wives start arguing because obviously this wasn't true, but Brunhild refuses to believe anything. So Krimhild says screw this and whips out Brunhild's belt and ring and exposes Siegfried's actions. Of course this would be very humiliating for both the Queen of Iceland and the King of Burgundy, but Gunther wanted to avoid conflict with Siegfried knowing that he'd get his ass whooped. So Siegfried is pardoned for his wife's actions and allowed to leave without consequence. However, a loyal knight to Gunther named Hagen couldn't stand for the shame of his king. So he makes a plot to sway Krimhild into revealing Siegfried's weak spot so that he could kill him. Not only does Krimhild reveal his weak spot, she also goes and marks it on his back with a cross so that Hagen would know exactly where it is when they went on their hunting trip. But how that's not suspect at all is beyond me too. Then comes the day of the hunting trip. Hagen and Siegfried are out searching for prey when they decide to take a break and get a drink from a nearby stream. Siegfried conveniently leans over, exposing his weak spot so that all Hagen has to do was just plunge the spear into his back. And that's exactly what happened. The legendary hero Siegfried, who slayed a dragon and defeated armies, dies from behind at the hands of one of his comrades. A real tragedy this one is. It's thought that he just let it happen, because people believe that Siegfried felt that if he was to remain living, a war would eventually break out between himself and Gunther. And as a man that has constantly helped others, he felt that his final deed to help everyone would be to just let himself die. Spoiler alert, it didn't really help. But that's an entirely different story for another date. Siegfried's story is interesting because the fate version of it, which is by the way essentially the same, explains Siegfried's motives a bit more. It's said that because Siegfried was such a great hero, he would never act of his own accord, but rather act on the wishes of others so that they may become true. Because that was the true responsibility of a hero who has been granted immense power. And it shows, in Siegfried's character. I mean, I don't think any other servant would just willingly give up their heart for this. But you know, it is what it is. So let's move on to his abilities now. Obviously, his greatsword Balmung is one of his noble phantasms. It's referred to as the Phantasmal Greatsword, Felling of the Sky Dragon. The blade itself is kind of a paradox because it's both cursed and holy at the same time. It can become either a demonic or holy sword depending on its wielder. There's a jewel located in the hilt that allows for Siegfried to release an anti-army type attack. Basically, it's the giant slash that we see in the show. All he has to do is chant, O oh sword, let thee be filled, then the jewel that stores the magical energy releases it all at once in one big strike. Then there's his armor. It's called the Armor of Fafnir. Blood Armor of the Evil Dragon. This incorporates the dragon's body into himself and grants him the invulnerability that he had when he was alive. It even affects his insides as well since he went and drank the dragon's blood too. Essentially, all physical and magical attacks have no effect, unless they're more powerful than the stuff from the Age of the Gods. Unlike Karna's though, it can't be removed. It's always active, basically a passive skill. However, just like in the legend, he's weakest at the spot in his back. It's marked by the shape of a leaf, and due to the curse in his past life, his back will always have to be exposed. Even a magical barrier would still leave a gap open to allow for his back to be striked, because that's just how potent the curse is. Then we've got one more noble phantasm, but it's really useless and we don't see it in the show. It's called Das Rheingold, and it's an ability that summons the treasure that he claimed after defeating Fafnir. As for skills, he has the riding skill as well which is consistent with all saber classes, as well as the Golden Rule skill, which is also pretty useless since it just measures his ability to acquire wealth. Obviously, referring to his past in which he acquired so much treasure from all his adventures. But yeah, that's pretty much Siegfried. Seems like once his identity is revealed, it wouldn't be too hard to eliminate him from the war, especially if you've got a skilled assassin on your side. It really is a shame that we didn't get to see him fight more. 
I mean, like, once he was gone from the black faction, in terms of power, the only strong servant they would have would have to be Vlad or someone. Maybe if Siegfried was still around, we wouldn't have to reinforce Estolfo and Sieg with so much plot armor. But oh well. As always, thanks for watching, and if you want to help decide who I cover in the next week's episode, then go ahead and vote in the poll under the community section. So until then, ciao!